Hello and welcome to Decoding Tech Trends with Dr. Harik Wynn, CTO of Tata Consultancy Services. Harik, hi, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Uh, my first question to you, I mean, I know Generative AI is the cool kid on the block. What is Gen AI? Gen AI is essentially all about trying to generate um, information from other forms of information. So something like text to code, text to image, almost text to anything. It has the ability to understand a large volume of text, summarize it, what I would call as recognition intelligence, where you recognize, extract, and classify. Um, the second thing, it has the ability to start reasoning about some correlational reasoning, uh, which sort of concepts that occur together, and, and then there's the ability to produce human-like English language. So, Businesses can now start using it or for all sorts of knowledge discovery tasks. For example, uh, um, let's say a call comes to a call center agent and there is a history of information collected about all the call logs. And they can easily say, well, Harik is calling. Who is Harik? Has he called before? Uh, what did he call about? What are the products Harik has bought from our company and so on and so forth. So the ability to extract all of this information, summarize it and provide that to the call center agent to improve the call center agent's contextual awareness is one great example of how something like this can be used. How is generative AI different from traditional AI then? Intelligence is usually in three forms, uh, what I would call as recognition intelligence, which is taking unstructured pieces of data, extracting something from it. So getting an image and saying, oh, here, this is a shape. The shape is a dog and dog is a mammal. That's all recognition intelligence. There is reasoning intelligence about what is happening, which is called descriptive reasoning. Why is it happening? Diagnostic reasoning. What is likely to happen? Predictive reasoning. And what is what should I do about it? Prescriptive reasoning. This is all part of what I would call as traditional AI. With generative AI, now we have what you have gotten is the ability to say that now that I've analyzed some situation, I understand the diagnosis. Can I now produce that in a form that somebody can understand? So traditional AI had a lot of capabilities. With generative AI, those capabilities have become, in a sense, very easy to consume for everyone. What is it that TCS can do in Gen AI? Are we already doing something uh, within TCS to leverage Gen AI? One category of uh, work that we are doing is how to make these AI slash Gen AI solutions easy to build. Because today, building AI Gen AI solution is an art form. We are essentially trying to figure out how to convert the art form into sort of well-engineered system. So that is one class of things. The other class of things that we are doing within TCS is actually applying Gen AI or AI to rethink or redefine a particular domain or a particular problem space. So we talked about contact centers earlier. Can we think about future of contact center that is AI first? So what do you mean when you say AI first? Today's contact centers are inherently reactive. People call, so there's inbound traffic. And that's why the, the contextual awareness of who is calling, etc., is very important. Now, imagine the future of contact center is actually no contact contact center. So there are no inbound calls or near zero inbound calls. The contact center is actually intelligent enough to know that Harik is likely to call and actually proactively outbound communicate with Harik about, oh, you might be thinking about this or might want to call about this, but here is the... So proactive personalized, context-aware, outbound communication will actually substitute inbound communication. And to do that, you need Gen AI, you need the ability to convert. So once again, traditional AI plus Gen AI will come together, right? Prediction that Harik is going to call, what should be told to Harik, and then Gen AI to actually communicate that in the form of, let's say, a text or a voice message or whatever the case may be. Now you have the com complete end-to-end -end intelligence. How do you then convince clients that this is something, this is an art form, and how do you then implement this art in, in your business? I keep saying this analogy of hammers and nails. Here's the hammer, let's go find nails. I think the approach that we are advocating is exactly the opposite, which is start with where you can generate greater value for your customers and then start asking the question, which of those additional values that we want to create 
you are going to actually leverage AI, Gen AI to actually augment. So it's all about knowledge discovery, the reasoning, the ability to actually communicate across different modalities, whether it is text, images, videos, and so on and so forth. All of that is actually has to be brought together. Rather than saying, I have a hammer, I'll go look for nails. It's actually saying, asking the question, which are the problems that are going to deliver the most significant value to the customer? And then decomposing that to saying, where can I apply some of these technologies to reimagine that? What happens to humans then? I mean, there's a lot of talk about uh, AI taking over jobs. And uh, I just want to understand uh, what this means, really. No, I think, I mean, for uh, us, it's all about augmenting people. It's about actually getting people to do work that is incredibly high quality. Instead of thinking about productivity improvement or faster, can we think about better? So we are, our entire philosophy is can we use AI, Gen AI to actually augment people to make better decisions that in fact control the quality of output that are actually generated. And that is where we feel the future is going to be. It's all about actually getting people to do lot better and so potentially a lot that more. Humans will still have jobs. Absolutely. <laughs> So what Much happens? more so. The role of people will start shifting from doers of work to um, decision makers, trainers of machines and handlers of exception. So the action will still have to be at the human end or? Uh... Action will be highly augmented by machines. Decisions and hence creativity is continue to stay with the human. There's a lot of chatter about you know, hallucinations when it comes to large language models. What are they? I think hallucination is a feature, not a bug of large language models. But essentially, uh, large language models are trained on their inherently correlational intelligence. If you ask the same question two times, you'll get a slightly different answer. You'll not get exactly the same answer, which is much like humans. That's what I was saying, human-like. That if you ask me the same question twice, I'll probably not give you exactly the same answer. So that's what actually is the perhaps the biggest um, discovery or invention with large language models. But that means that this notion of non-determinism is a key feature. The moment you remove that, it becomes robotic. And in which case it will no longer remain as interesting as it is today. That's why I keep saying that hallucination is not a bug, it's a feature. What, what's the future of this look like? Uh, you know, it's, it's evolving as we speak. So I think um, the large language models themselves are evolving. Uh, they are evolving in their ability to reason. They will become more and more sophisticated in their ability to reason. And they will support more and more types of data. So on the enterprise side, the future is going to be interesting. Do you take a complex problem that is occurring within an enterprise and throw it to a complex model and then let it actually give you good answers? Or you take a complex problem and break it down into a large number of little problems and then throw each little problem to an appropriate engine. So every enterprise, every business is going to have to constantly keep asking the question, which of the two approaches should I take? Or, and should I start out as one and then move to the other? Because then typically these complex large language models will also become very expensive. So the cost, performance, trade-offs and all of that is something that every enterprise will have to fight. What are the skills that are required to tap into this new uh, technology? The most interesting programming language for the future is English. So you don't need to actually know a lot of different... So your ability to use this technology using intelligent interrogation, which is what is called as prompt engineering, is going to become an important skill. So in a sense, this is sort of akin to what if you today wanted to do search on Google, there are people who are brilliant at searching to find the answer they're looking for very quickly. So exactly the same skill will actually get developed. But in addition to that, the art form today is all about data science, understanding data, understanding how to use data, understanding which data you should use, which data you shouldn't use, which data will cause a bias, which data won't cause a bias. So from a technical perspective, those skills are going to be very important. But from a purely end user perspective, the reason why 
you sort of saw 100 million people start using chat GPT in no time was because it is so easy to use. It is English as the, the language. And that's a great note to end the show with. Thank you, Dr. Harik, for your time today. It was a Thank pleasure you having you here.